Welcome to pick number 12. Woo! Where's Alex? Alex. Let's call Alex. Where is he? Alex, where are you, man? How's it going? Yeah, great. How are you? It's not virtual. I'm supposed to be in Berlin. You're supposed to be in Berlin. Get to Berlin, Alex. Jesus. Okay, get this. Seriously? Yeah. Welcome to the pick, everybody. Where time is one of the important things about the pick. Innovators have four minutes to get their idea across. But before we get there, are you innovating every day? No? Yes? Who, who is? Yes? Yes in the back? A couple of people there? Well, let me ask you a different question. Are you inspiring every day? Are you learning every day? Are you growing every day? I should go for a lecture with this one. Look, at the pig, we still believe innovators and inspiration can come from everywhere, anywhere, honestly. Sometimes we found innovators have a great idea, but they just need a stage. You know, a platform, sometimes a push to get up there, sometimes no, sometimes they want to get up quickly. Uh, we, we, we just have to be open to giving them that and allowing them to do that. And that's what we try to do with the pick. We're open to all innovators in our industry. Anyone know who this is? Anyone? Who is it? Um, famous chef who does humanitarian work. Jose Andreas. So he has like 20 restaurants. In 2017, he was stirring a pan in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And let's start our afternoon with a dose of inspiration. It also allows people time to get in. So let's hear from Jose Andreas. First of all, um, in addition to the adoration of your peers and the industry, uh, Multilingual Magazine is uh, kind enough, thank you, Marjolan, 
for offering these great prizes for our first, uh, thank you, Marianne, for our winner and runner-up. Uh, the winner also, uh, which will be announced tomorrow, um, the reason we have to do that we'll explain a little later when we talk about how the voting works, um, but the winner will also receive a plaque um, and what is it now, a million dollars? Just under. Okay, yeah, yeah. so anyway, um, I don't know, I'll get, I'll get back to you on that, so. Um, but thanks for being here, everyone. Um, I also want to go ahead and just thank uh, Dave uh, and XTM for all of their support. And I'd like to thank Donna and Ulrich for giving us the chance to put this competition on, which has become um, my shared baby with you, I guess. And I mean, we've seen it grow bigger and bigger. And it's all about giving the innovators in the industry a chance to, to shine. And that's what we're going to do. So we're about to get out of the way here. So. The team, you've met some of them. Let's meet our dragons. So I'll ask them to come up on stage because they're hiding away there somewhere. <laughs> so Bert. Yeah. You may have read Bert's book. If you haven't, go and look first. You might have to t get rid of some dust off the covers. Uh, Julia is a pick winner. Welcome, Julia. Patricia is a pick participant and runner-up. Welcome, Patricia. Second runner-up. And Hoken is the local talent here, and many people will know in the industry. So thank you for joining us, Hoken. You know who we are. It's final time. Let's get the show on the road, because time is of the essence. So this is our finalists, Andrea, Gary, Robert, Sarab, and Constantine. Andrea. Great. Thank you for being here today. It's great to see you all. So uh, let's make a ride and uh, tell you about, about uh, what we are dealing with, uh, voicing the unvoiced it with our new system that is Universal AI's voice dubbing. Um, Voice is a very important media in human communication in any language and any culture. Uh, voice is now produced in recording studio with actors and directors, and usually it's a very uh, intense process since it's a lot of preparation and a lot of attention for go through the process, and also expensive. Um, of course, and voice has been recorded usually with the same process for decades, but uh, now something is changing. So let's take a look at the picture and we see that the premium content is now traditionally recorded with the voice and actors in the studio. At the bottom, we can see non-premium content that is currently recorded, and not recorded, but managed by TTS system that are typically not expressive. At the center, we have a massive untapped opportunity. There's a, it's a Latin market, it's still not, say, uh, there, but it's there and it's coming up with our new innovation. That's, uh, that's very important. There's billions of stories still untold and unvoiced. So, uh, publisher and brands have the growing need to distribute expressive voice content all around the globe, since uh, the users that they need to feed with content is definitely would appreciate voices in the expressive local, local, local language. But at the same time, there's not a real uh, uh, easy and efficient solution for achieving that. So usually there's a number of huge amount of content that is just translated and subtitled, is not dubbed, and finally user can't enjoy the content in their native languages. So what to do? We have created a new AI technology uh, also with the help of uh, European community since they have been winning a grant in October 2021. The technology can create and emulate any voice, control any style, and to and from any language, okay? This is really something that can uh, speed up the overall process from month to days and reduce the cost consistently. So, how it works? Since once we have the tech, we need to use it. Let's go, and this is, is our cloud-based AI voice dubbing. You can in-source uh, uh, source text and audio and target text, and the system automatically is creating 
the target audio in all language, preserving the voice texture and the style in all of them. So uh, this can uh, really be a game changer in the voice, expressive voice industry. So uh, let's take a look at some example and uh, we can hear the original recorded voice in studio and then the virtually generated voices. Please note how the voice are similar and are sharing the same expression. The ground's shaking, it's an earthquake. Les sols tremblent, c'est un tremblement de terre. La terre sta tremando, è un terremoto. Der Boden bewegt sich, das ist ein Erdbeben. El suelo tiembla, es un terremoto. These are just five languages. We're going to prove the languages and increase the spectrum of all this since the technology is natively multilingual. So now we can do and we can tell more stories. The story is usually untold and we can voice it and voice it with a new universal AI voice dubbing system. And thank you for your attention. So well done. Really interesting stuff. Thank you. And um, now, here's a question for you. Sure. Could you deal with my accent? Of course, yes. Oh. <laughs> Give us that time and we can manage. Let's play with it later then. Yes. Dragons, have we questions for Andrea? Yep. Is it working? Yep. It is. Um, I just have just, just a quick one on, um, you said it would bring the cost down considerably, so I'd love to understand whether you could define considerably. Um, and the second is, like, there's no doubt that this is impressive, right? Um, and what I love about the pick is that there's a dream element. To me, that there needs to be a dream element. Um, and this is definitely there, right? Um, but like, what is the dream? Like, what do you want to be? Where do you go from here? Yeah, let me start with the cost. It's up to 10 times less, okay? But we will definitely, uh, we will work on that. And uh, the dream is that I've been recording voices for uh, more than 25 years, and uh, I basically thought, as they were saying, that it's time for a change. And let's, let's put our efforts and our experience to make this change happen. So we have built up this new company with the talented data scientists, and let's try to challenge. And this is why I'm here today, to do something in a different way. Can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a little question. Sure. Uh, I was noticing that uh, the German sample sounded already a bit strange, so um, how is it when the language is culturally more distant from the source language, like yeah. when you go into an Asian language or so, where people have a different way of expressing uh, yes. emotions, how well does it work there? We are building a unique data set in which we have been analyzing the psychological, uh, let's say, human uh, attitudes and we are, uh, say, setting up specific data set to correlate the psychological to how the phonatory system is working. So when you are going to from language to another language, you will have the chance to tweak this accordingly to the culture and the local culture. This is, it's, it's a long process, and this with AI system, you need to have data, something that is not existing, and you need to elaborate them wisely, and of course, Start with the need and create a tech to solve the need, not the opposite. I also have a yep. question. How about the translation right now? Yep. How do you get the translation? Is this machine translation or not yet? I mean, we are, we are just voice. We do not translate. Translation is a different thing, and there's a multitude of people here that knows a lot of it, okay? So we are just focusing one problem, and then, of course, we do the rest but the translation is, is not our scope. We can definitely work together and team up with the solutions, but no translation. It's too complicated. <laughs> Still time for a question? Yeah, go, Bert. Okay, two very quick questions. Um, timing, I mean, with voice recording, timing is always a big challenge, yeah. right? How does your solution support timing? Yeah, so you see the, the timing from the source and the target, or the timing of the overall production? Well, just fitting the audio in a certain context, like an e-learning or, or like a dubbing of a video? Yeah, so uh, we, we have a, a path that starts from the game industry and more and move more into multiple verticals. At the moment, we start with single files, and of course, we can control the length, the how this is the natural speed of the source can impact the target, okay? Then we can set up time constraints and 
from time constraints, we can go to sound sync. Sound sync means that within a single file, we have poses, and we can place the things in the proper places. Okay. And this will be integrated with more and more other things. All right. Uh, one last question. You mentioned you can emulate any voice. Um, yeah. Can you do deep fakes like Nicolas Cage's voice or Obama? Or yeah, I mean, we potentially can do that, but we don't want to do that. Since uh, uh, the technology is able to emulate any input, so you throw any voice in the system, it becomes out similar, but this is, is a choice. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do the same. We just want to do something similar in voice texture and in uh, voice expression that is consistent with the local culture. Okay. Brilliant. Just, just, just a second. Yeah. Just one sec. Um, so when we think about um, machine translation and mm -hmm. how it changed things, right? Like yeah. in terms of yeah. where do you see the impact of this is going? You know the industry, right? You've, you've said yeah. you've done this a long time. Um, if yeah. you could take like a neutral stance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, this, uh, the impact can, of, of this technology can be similar to the machine translation. So humans will stay in the loop. So the system will basically suggest a target sentence. Then with the number of features we are tuning and fixing now, the user can approve the sentence, change the text, move the text, change pitch, intonation, speed, energy, and emission. So you can speak loud or you can speak slowly and very, very whispering. It depends, but all these colors will be part of it and the human will be the one that decides how to deliver the thing. Well, with that, with all the colors, Andrea, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Great to be here. Next up is Gary. Over to you, Gary. Autonomous, uninterrupted localization. That's the definition for continuous localization. The emphasis is on uninterrupted. Continuous localization is much more than just a script running on a server, dumping files, resources into a hot folder, which is what I often hear. Those usually run on cluster of servers. Servers that are expensive to run, complex to maintain, they are slow, and ultimately they are a bit of a nightmare. So I had to think of a way of running continuous localization, avoiding all of those servers, the complexity, the expense, and so on. It really needed to be cheap because I needed to please the bosses. <laughs> so after a lot of deep thought, I came up with using microservices. A microservice is a small piece of code that wakes up, performs its function, and then it's destroyed. These are really cheap to operate because we're not paying for a server or a cluster of servers to operate for 365 days of the year, which is really expensive, let alone the expense to the environment. Microservices, when they wake up, we start charging. That's how much we pay for it. We're talking milliseconds, not hours, days, months, years, and so on. And microservices are really cool. They wake up, they perform their function, but they're also very reliable. Let's say one of the microservices has a fault. It will replace it with a new microservice, and we keep that service running. There's no downtime at all. If the load increases, we can increase the number of pods or Kubernetes pods to keep that service running and supporting extraneous load. Once that load falls, we shut down those pods. We don't have to pay for them anymore. Not only is this cheap to run, it does make it extremely reliable. And operating microservices across multiple availability zones allows us to maintain that reliability regardless of where that service is running anywhere in the world. They're self-healing, and that's a really good thing to have, especially when you want your continuous localization platform to be uninterrupted. So ultimately, using microservices makes continuous localization faster, it saves a huge amount of time, and ultimately, again, it reduces costs.
Thank you. Great job, Gary. Uh, let's take some questions. Dragons. Sure. Um, well, Gary, as you know, I'm a fan. Um, I was your coach. I really believe in this model. I think it's extremely innovative and, uh, and groundbreaking even. Um, I think a lot of people in the industry have you know, walked uh, or talked the talk about continuous localization, but nobody's actually managed to really walk the walk the way you've done it. Um, the other thing that I found really innovative about your presentation is the only one without AI in it. Um, <laughs> or did I miss something? Is there an AI element in whatever you've built? There is no machine learning or artificial intelligence. Any plans in that direction? No, it's simple <laughs> enough already. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. How long did it take um, you to get the buy-in from the rest of engineering? Oh, that took a long time. <laughs> Yes, it took a lot of convincing because not so much the technology or the use of microservices, the entire platform, that part of it was well and truly understood. The hard part was convincing managers that nobody was going to lose their job as a result of continuous localization, especially the microservices. So in a nutshell, I would say the hard part, convincing the senior leadership would have taken maybe six months which is a fraction of the time it took to actually implement, by the way. <laughs> um, okay. um, is any software developed ready for continuous localization or before getting there with everything is hap happening automatically, continuously and with microservice, before getting there, there's some work that has to be done to make sure that that, that software doesn't have technical depth or it's a good candidate for continuous localization. Oh, are we talking about the products that are on the platform? Whatever you run in this platform to get, so you can get the translations. Okay. I would say there's really no challenges on, with onboarding any of the products. We have over uh, 400 that are either queued up or already onboarded. There's nothing that's been too complicated in terms of that onboarding process. And as for running continuous localization with the microservices, we haven't had any challenges at all with that operation. Once we start it, it just does its thing. So there's no challenges on board in the teams. It's any type of software, any type of development strategy can be on board here. Okay, so for turning this to the development teams, the onboarding process is a something that just takes a few days to understand their repositories, how everything is set up, and then we just take that information, set up the repository listener service, which integrates with their tools and services, and then we just run with it. There's also the addition of considerations for build services and testing as well, but we can roll those in without any effort at all. Quick question, how do you tie in third-party products? So is the concept of software as a service somewhat overlapping or even competing with your concept of microservices? So the, the microservices are self-contained within the platform. The integrations with third-party tools such as translation management systems and computer-aided translation, they are really on the periphery. And we're able to use the core service to communicate with the translation management system utilizing the TMS APIs. So we don't need to do anything special other than learning those APIs and how we can integrate that with our core functionality. Okay. Great. Well, no more questions. Good. Gary, thank you very much. have our next innovator join us. Robert, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear dragons, my name is Robert, but today you can call me the TM Doctor because today I'll have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the longevity of translation memories and how to assure it. Uh, translation memory, in a sense, is like a set of teeth because it allows you to bite into your translation content uh, way easier than without it. 
by the sheer virtue of owning a translation memory, you can reduce the cost of translation by up to 25%, and you can make your translators work twice as fast as compared to when you don't have a translation memory at all. Unfortunately, with time, TMs, just like TIFF, become subject to deterioration, to decay. And you will start seeing issues popping up, like erroneous context matches used without review, and inconsistent translations, and also split segments. Unfortunately, uh, this cleanup, this routine checkup, it wasn't sustainable for the longest time. For a human to go through 100,000 segments of text, it would take them around 1,000 1, hours to just find all the issues in the TM. It just wasn't worth it up until now. With our new artificial intelligence enabled method, we can reduce this time by 95% from, uh, from 1,000 hours to just 50. And this is how it works. Our artificial, artificial intelligence model, it creates a map of the entirety of the translation memory. It assigns a score to every single segment. This score means how close the model thinks the source segment and the target segment are in meaning. So the segments assigned zero will be untranslated segments. Segments from the range of 0 to 0 0.4 from experience will be sound, good translations. Unfortunately, over the 0 0.4 threshold, you will start seeing uh, issues. The higher the number here, the higher the likelihood and magnitude of errors you will start seeing. Uh, for a human to go through a lot of text in a translation memory and just fish out the issues, it's a really hard mental task. But with our method, we can just sort and filter the issues and expose it to human review. We do the same with untranslated segments. We have a specially trained AI model that just fishes out the important untranslated segments that should be exposed to human review. To summarize, this method excels at reducing the time and cost of such an endeavor. It just learns with time getting better and better. And most of all, it is fine-tuned and it focuses on those severe translation issues. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'd love to answer your question. Can I, just I, I have a question first off, if the dragons don't mind. Oh yes. Firstly, does anyone feel like going to the room and washing their teeth right now <laughs> after lunch? Uh, applicability, right? So how can this be applied? Is this something that you'd like to bring on to, to make it available in, in a wide sort of space? Uh, definitely. This method, right now, it's uh, after more than a year of development, it's at a stage that it can be scaled out and it can incorporate just any TM that comes in. We can service any translation memory that comes our way. There are no boundaries at this stage. Excellent. Dragons, questions? So you're using the similarity between this source and target um, as a parameter to decide whether it needs post-editing. Um, what are the risks? Um, of these sort of having a negative impact on um, positive deviations. On positive deviations. Between source and target text. Uh, so this method, when it uh, assigns its score, uh, it determines how close the source and target are in terms of meaning. This, of course, is an approximation of, uh, of a human review of a segment. The human will always, at least for a long time, be able to best determine the closeness between the source and target text, decide if something is mistranslated or not. This method, it learns with time, that with every single TM that comes into the system, it gets better and better at this approximation. There is a slight deviation, statistical deviation, that always happens. So uh, let's say our method assigns a score of 0.5. You will sometimes see actual sound translations in that area. But this is just statistical deviation. We've run certain experiments that allowed us to see where we will see the majority of actual errors and just statistically 
be able to infer that the majority of errors will be there. So um, in terms of the, the content type that you've used, so that... Um uh, content type is uh, another issue that needs data for the AI models because especially for technical complex content, uh, you don't see normal translations and the AI model that's been trained on general content and needs fine tuning. So we are still getting there when it comes to specialized content, but this is really efficient for general purpose content, uh, marketing content, HR content, even medical content to some degree, but not necessarily really complex technical texts. Robert, I have a quick question. Um, so it seems that your method is focusing on uh, figuring out or sorting out the errors, but isn't the decay of a TM not rather coming from that over the time translations get outdated due to style changes, terminology changes and so on, so not necessarily errors, but simply changes which happened on the way uh, the translation memory is used? Very good question, thank you very much. Uh, I would agree it's part of the issue, not the entirety of it, because yes, an avoidable truth is that if you change your corporate terminology over time, it won't adhere to what happened five years ago. But also, you can have human-made issues in translation memories that just were not spotted, especially in context matches, 100% matches, those types of matches that are rarely, if ever, checked in translation. So the ideal future, uh, starting from this method, would be a continuous platform to run and update translation memories in real time, spot those issues over and over in real time rather than do uh, cyclical cleanups. In my experience, these errors often add up because the, the feedback loop in the end after a document has been revised back to the translation memory is often broken or not existing. And uh, one way to fix this, of course, would be to, because you're storing the data in two different places, one way to fix this, of course, would be to rather use the, pre -transla uh, the translated bilingual files as your repository or as your translation memory so that you only have it in one place. That would fix that issue. Uh, that is our um, aim for the future. Starting with this method, we intend to create a system that will tie together translation and uh, translation memory management in a real-time scenario, and it will be updated and safeguarded in real time. So the majority of the issues will be mm, cut, cut in real time and, and basically fixed. Although when terminology changes over time, then yes, you have to, I suppose, discard that part of the TM if terminology changes. That's an unfortunate fact. Okay. Well, we have to stop it there, Robert. Good discussion. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So if you've just joined us, you're, you're not a math class, we're talking about standard deviations and all that stuff, but you're not. Uh, we'll ask our next innovator on stage. Sarah. So good afternoon, Dragons, and hello everyone. I am super excited about the innovation that I'm going to present to you today, source code internationalization self-healing using artificial intelligence. We call it Dr. Global, and this technology has been already published as an invention on the IP.com database. So why making software products global ready is always so challenging? It feels like a very tiring process, isn't it? That's because prevailing software internationalization processes and technology is not good enough, and uh, which is because it is based on primitive rule-based static code analysis uh, tools and systems, which is inefficient and error-prone. It requires a lot of manual efforts to find and fix, fix the issues with this technology, previous technology, and that results into high cost of quality, and we see pushback from our stakeholders, and ultimately it results into inconsistent quality and experience for our customers. Dr. Global is NetApp's solution. It is source code internationalization self-healing using AI. And it's an abbreviation for dependable and reliable globalization logic based on AI and ML. 
So Dr. Global saves more than 90% of internationalization efforts, and uh, that, that's because the developers can apply it right when they are writing their code in the IDEs. So source code scans are more intelligent with the AI now, and it is based on several years of data behind it. An AI-enabled recommendation system actually gives warnings or alerts to the developers if they are making a mistake while writing the code for, for internationalization. And then the automated remediation system uh, actually uh, learns from those mistakes and fixes and applies fixes all over the code uh, without any manual intervention. So overall, this becomes as a self-healing system. And this is a major shift left because the prevailing technology and tool today uh, that works only when the issue has taken place and then it is in the code and it is very reactive. However, Dr. Global is proactive because it starts working as soon as the developer starts writing the code. And uh, at NetApp, we have seen that uh, without Dr. Global, previously we used to see huge number of internationalization issues, but now with Dr. Global, we see that issues are prevented, more than 90% issues are prevented now. So now let's get to the fun part and hear from Dr. Global what it has to say about itself. Hi, this is Dr. Global. My job is to find and fix internationalization issues for you. You can plug me into the IDE where the developers write their code. Here you can select the directories where you want to run my AI scans. Hit the start scan button. Hit the show issues button to see all the issues I have found. When you select an issue, I will highlight it in the code. I have recommended a fix. Apply the fix to your code. Select the files for self-healing similar issues. Hit self-heal button for automatic fixing of all issues. Please tell me if I reported a false issue, I will correct myself. So that's how Dr. Global works and NetApp is years ahead of the industry with this technology because internationalization is now fully automated with AI and ML and code scans are highly accurate because we see very minimal number of false positives with this technology. It is scalable to multiple number of uh, programming languages cloud-based, fully compliant with the DevOps pipelines, and overall Dr. Global is preventive, proactive, and fast, which makes software product internationalization fast and fun with Dr. Global. Thank you. Great job. Dragons, questions? That was impressive, Sora. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I'm happy to see that false positives are dead, thanks yeah. to artificial <laughs> intelligence and uh, language uh, learning. So I, I, I have a question. So how did you encourage developers to use this system? Because I can see this is something you plug in in the IDE, but how, how are they happy? What, how do you encourage them to make sure that they run the scan? Well, well, in fact, earlier with our previous tools, the static code analysis tools, they used to be very annoyed because then false positives and it used to take forever to, to actually find which is the true positive, which is the false positive, and to identify and fix that. First, you have to clean up the report itself, right? Now we have all very accurate and cleaner reports with us, and uh, that, that makes it easier job for them. The other important aspect, as Dr. Global himself talked about itself, was that it highlights the issue. So if I am a developer, I'm thinking about a feature or a new technology in the code, I don't want to be always bothered about what are the internationalization standards that I have to follow. So for that, it always highlights if there, it, it gives a warning message, as I think in a brief time I could show. It gives a warning message. This is something like when you write a document in Word, you get wrong spelling highlighted is something similar. If, if, if there is a mistake uh, in terms of internationalization compliance, it highlights it. And also suggests, like a spell checker, it suggests the right code. The developer can just click it and uh, just is fixed. And on top of it, all the similar issues, if you hit the self-heal button, all similar issues, because AI is based on learning from patterns of mistakes and improvements. And that's how it fits. So developers are now more confident uh, and they don't have to really worried about internationalization. They are 
quite, quite encouraged with this. Could you give me some examples of error categories you're catching? All, all the important categories, for example, externalization of the strings, or it could be locale specific date, time, currency like issues, or, or concatenation issues, any of that. So what we have done is over the period of several years, all the issues that we had identified through the previous methods, we categorized them, made it uh, available for the machine learning engines uh, to learn from it, and uh, we are using it for most of these categories. And what is the business model? How do you deploy this? Are you um, centralizing the AI so that I can benefit from the mistakes other software developers have made? Yes, so we have a, a servers-based uh, architecture where all those mistakes, the only difference is we have different modules for different type of products that we have and different programming languages. But that is all together, it's centralized so that we make the system learn from these because for different programming languages we have to have a different kind of syntax a little bit, but that's how it works. Just a quick one. For someone who's been at the receiving end of the frustration uh, given by false positives, what is the false positive rate compared to genuine issues? Um, I'm sorry, if you asked about the number of false positives that we see now? Versus genuine issues. Yeah, so basically, if, if I remember, I would take the exact name of the tool, but most of the industry uses that tool uh, for, for so, uh, static code analysis. So that tool, when we used at NetApp, used to give some 60% of false positives. Then we hired an open source tool called SonarCube. We could do better with our own rules. And, uh, but still we were seeing something around 35, 40% of false positives. With Dr. Global, because it keeps learning, uh, a, a very matured uh, system or, or very matured model would have less than 10 to 15% of false positives and it keeps on improving it itself. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, Sarah, thank you very, very much. Well thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks. Doctor Global, TM Doctor, yeah, a lot of medics around today, in case you're feeling. Yeah, lots of stuff to fix. Great, so let's move on. Constantine. Hello. Uh, my name is Konstantin Savinkov. I'm CEO co founder of Intanto. I actually represented here our director of product who didn't make it here from Dublin. Um, and I presented here our small innovation, which makes many people happy. It's about translating ICUs, which stands for Inter International Components for Unicode. So what all that about? So imagine Dev decided to develop an application which shows, shows how many participants are impressed with big presentations, right? So it's like a live feed. I mean, some of them are already impressed. And depending on the number, the sentence structure changes. And also, in other languages, you may have different number of plurals, for example, in Ukrainian. So how, how it all works. So engineers developed a format, which like a template with small segments, one segment per option, and then the system constructs the final text from this plural, from this template. And engineers love it. Um, it's very flexible, and they can internalize the code without you know, creating those exploding branching structures for every language. Beautiful. So what do you think translators think about that? So they develop this thing from their customer. They allow to, to their favorite cat tool. Uh, and at best, it will highlight, probably, you know, the structure of this template. It also may break this template, or it may just give them the source code. And well, you know, we found that translators are not on good terms with uh, source code, really. So it creates lots of room for mistakes. They can just mess with brackets or edit something you're not supposed to be added. And, and the cost of such mistakes is very high because it, or it breaks continuous development, continuous localization, right? It's developed, it's figured out on a QA stage, it gets back to the localization or maybe even to the end users. And of course, machine translation, no machine translation engine works with ICU. And again, at best, you're getting those chunks translated as small pieces of text, having very low linguistic quality. So we decided, okay, let's fix it. Um, 
How we fix it? Well, we take this template for every language we have a uh, set of these plurals defined. We roll, like, unwrap this template, generating all possible sentences. We translate them using machine translation to the target language, and then we assemble, compile them back to the template. There's some boring stuff uh, under the hood, like AI to do word alignment. I'll only tell them about that. But the main thing, it works, and uh, it makes translators happy, log managers happy, while keeping software engineers happy, and eventually it makes end users happy. So actually, it's used by one of our customers who does infrastructure for travel industry. So if you're traveling here, and seeing these short sentences with numbers in your language, most likely you're already using it. Um, yeah, thanks, that's it. So they are like it. Let's see if our dragons like it, Konstantin. Dragons. Two quick questions. Uh, how many of your customers are actually using ICU? How often do you see it? And then um, how do you deploy this innovation? Yeah, so currently it's one customer, one I mentioned. And it's deployed in a way that we, we provide them an API. And they deploy it before it gets uh, delivered to the TMS. So um, I think we talked about it in the preliminary rounds, but um, this is about software streams, right, mostly. Um, how often do you experience that customers actually already fully rely on MT for software localization? So um, uh, that's the thing is um, they, do, they typically do not use MT for this part, but when we ask the customer, so what's your quality baseline? Mm -hmm. Like w they told us that, well, there is none. Because if they take ICU strings translated by human translators, they contain so many mistakes because of that, mm -hmm. that f what you get from empty already like two hats better. Yeah, okay. All right, so you're saying that already with this model that your empty output is more reliable than human translation? For yes, software strings. yes. Okay, well stated. According to engineers. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> What's the confidence level that they don't contain mistakes after you've sort of composed, recomposed the string after you've translated in parallel? Well, um, you know, how, how we typically work when we um, evaluate machine translation and configure machine translation for a specific uh, purpose, we do that on plain text, right? Where we figure out, okay, we train it, we add a glossary, we do this tone of voice, maybe gender control to, to, to make it right. And together with our end user, we ensure that the final result is good enough for the task. So the goal we're achieving here is that for this complex template, it's not worse than the, for plain text. Because a big problem here is one of the problems. If you're trying to uh, apply machine translation, which you use for localization, for this very complex format, your quality drops significantly. So we're trying to get, to bridge this gap. In quality, we just work separately on that. All right, we'll take one more question, if you have yeah, it. Very quickly. You mentioned this has been developed for a particular customer. Is this something you plan to make like mainstream for anybody using your systems? Yeah, it's, um, it's happening as I'm talking here, basically, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. W one last question, Hocken, or no? No, we're good. Thank you, Constantine. <laughs> So great, that's your innovators, right? What happens next? Anyone know what happens next? No, voting. We, you get to vote. Now, do we, not say, do we not tell you that before? So you get to vote, right? And Alex is gonna explain a little bit about how that works. And um, so get ready. And Alex, let's start the procedure. All right. And actually, can you bring the music down so I can explain? Thank you. So the way you're going to vote is using this QR code to slido.com. Um, there's a hashtag box. This actually, the QR code will take you right there. If for some reason it doesn't, open a browser on your phone or your computer. Slido.com, there's a hashtag. 
LW47. That's gonna get you in and go to the live poll. Just to make sure, is it active? Is everyone seeing it? Has anyone voted yet? Loading, loading, okay. It should be under polls. Um, let me, if it hasn't been activated, I will activate it in just a moment. Let me explain quickly what the voting is though. So uh, we have our dragons up here and I also just wanted to mention that each of these dragons was kind enough to coach individually one of our innovators. So that's why you might've seen a little bit of bias in that, but to, to understand how the voting works, the, the judges are gonna give us their top three waiting the first one uh, at, uh, at the highest level, second and third. Okay. So we will then take all of your attendee votes and the attendee okay. votes will Refresh be weighted 50% versus 50% for the dragons. So has anyone been able to vote yet? I may have to, okay, so I had a problem before. Give me just a second. I also wanna say the voting is gonna be open for the next hour. You do need to be a registered attendee, which all of you are because you're here, but we will be double checking that. So don't stuff the ballot box. You're only getting to vo uh, vote yeah, once. No family and friends. Yeah, but... no family and friends. So I will activate it right now while so you're talking. If you do have a problem even with that, just find Alex and I and let us know. And um, meanwhile, you know, you can vote away. We're just going to give you a bit of information, right? Pick has been going five years. Uh, we've had over 60 finalists, and we've added five more of those today. Uh, technology pitches are a little bit ahead in the final in terms of representation, um, but we've always kind of kept this about, you know, whatever type of innovation you have, and those two categories tend to be the two buckets, process and technology. Uh, we've had over 200 innovators uh, submit to the pick over five years. Cool, huh? So we're hoping for 200 more in the next couple of years. Um, we've had a number of people who've been multiple submitters, uh, including Konstantin, who we just saw on stage, Rafael Yavorsky, Takiyoshi from Human Science, and Olivier from Lingoport. So, you know, keep them coming. Message to you is, if interested, talk to Alex and I. Get involved in the pick. We'd love to hear about your, your idea. Over the five years, process technology, it's a little bit closer. We have innovators from all over, right? There's no one particular geography that is leading the way. This might be interesting. What topics are showing up? You know, where are the innovations coming from? So you can see in the pie there that, you know, there's quite a lot of stuff, connectivity in green at the back, MT leading the way on the left top. Uh, these are our top four, you know, MT, Quality Agile, localization model. What does that mean? That's the kind of process. How do you manage localization? So typically a, a buy side company would submit that. Um, that's a snapshot. Recently we've seen localization model and multimedia come more into the topics that have been submitted. Um, that's a snapshot though, and we're going to build out more findings during the back end of this year to look at the trends a little bit more carefully and we'll be sharing that with PIC fans. Was anyone around at the PIC, what, four years ago? I showed this slide. Um, yeah, there you go. We had this moonshot idea that, oh, could we get uh, investors involved maybe, just, you know, just to turn up and give some guidance. We'll get new people involved, center stage it at Lockworld, which is where we are now and at a board. Well, real quick, we did have people with investment background get involved. We had Vitali, we had Peter, we have Hoken. Thank you very much for joining us for a second time. They give a different perspective. Uh, we do coaching with the innovators ahead of the final. And of course, you heard their questions here today. So thank you, investors. Box ticked. Pick advisory board. We set that up last year. This is them. Anyone in the audience? Wave your hand or stand up. I think I saw Donna earlier, I don't see her. Hi, thank you to them for really keeping us uh, focused. And center stage, well that's here, right? No parallel sessions. Some people are having a coffee, but you're all here, so thank you for that. And thank you Lockworld for making that happen. How's the voting going? Working. Working? Yeah. Anyone not? Come find us later.
Okay, hopefully you could hear that. It'll be working. Any problems can find us. Um, you know, at the PIC, we like to evolve um, how we're doing things. You know, we, we change it up a little bit. Um, we keep the good stuff. Uh, we've had some great innovations in the previous round, which didn't make it to the final. We had, as you saw earlier, we had 14 people make the preliminaries. You can find those, uh, and I suggest you have a look, because some really interesting ones in there and the Lockworld YouTube channel. And you can see the two uh, lads there in the middle are the two preliminary rounds. Um, who in the room has either won or runnered up in the pick in the past? Stand up, please. Stand up. Look. There's a bunch of people in the room. Thank you, guys. Thank you for supporting us.